continues. That is why we have come today and every Sunday at 32 to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But God, not just in this place, but Lord, every day in our lives, in our places of work and school and Lord, with our friends and with our family, I pray today that you might stir within us the desire to go, the devotion to grow, and more than anything else, Lord, just, Lord, an overwhelming sense of urgency to make known the news that Jesus Christ is born and that He lives and that He defeated death, hell, and the grave. What a blessing to gather this morning. We pray that you might be pleased with all that is said and done. Holy Spirit, come work in and through this service. Touch every heart. Lord, just change every life. For the gospel's sake, in Jesus' name, amen. Take a few moments, read those around, and tell somebody how to read uh, good stuff. Uh, on the front, I encourage you maybe to read that a little bit later as I'm just reflecting over uh, our Christmas and all that God has done and His blessings in my head. Much more known to me in prayer for our Newport Mission team. Uh, there's a group of 10 of us, and uh, we'll be leaving right after the service and heading uh, to New York to do ministry. And we're grateful for that. We're working in the homeless shelter and also uh, on the streets, uh, passing out socks to people uh, in need. So pray for us to be back on Thursday. And at the end of the service, we'll have a time of commissioning and prayer for that team uh, as well. Don't forget all the things going on throughout the week. Our Thursday evening prayer meeting and Bible study Saturday is our next men's breakfast and prayer time. That's always a great time at the camp. But hey, beginning January the 8th, our connections uh, study will begin. You see the information in your bulletin. Do be in prayer as we begin next week a series on the local New Testament church. I'm excited about that. And that just as we begin a fresh, a new year looking at what the Bible has to say about the church. And just uh, understand that in the 21st century, unfortunately, uh, the church doesn't resemble that of the New Testament in any way. So we want to make sure as we continue to grow, looking into our fifth year of the late church, that we're staying uh, true to the Bible. And we look forward to that Sunday nights tonight, no ID camp, but back next week and uh, starting the new year off there for our youth and our kids, um, Monday nights, Lake Church Choir, and uh, then you see also, we need some help, and there's some items specifically listed areas uh, that you might can volunteer, pray about that, be involved as you would, make sure at the end of the service you go by and check out the vest and t-shirts, and also the uh, blueprints of the proposed church building, and we're going to quit calling it a church building, we're going to call it the ministry center, because it is so much more than just a church or a worship center, to be a place seven days a week, ministry will be going on, and we're excited about that. Speaking of ministry, it's God's blessing. blessing. We are so grateful to tell you that the entire month of January, our camp will be full. A group from AmeriCorps will be there packing it out, working in the community. And then the entire month of March is already booked full up. No vacancy. That's amazing. So we're grateful for that. Amen. And uh, we're just... Uh, Looking forward to more blessings throughout the year. So those off, um, you know, off calendar months normally at White Lake, uh, most places are closed and we're full. So that is only by the, by the amazing hand of God. Continue to pray and look forward to what God is going to do at the camp and at the church. There's some notes on the back concerning our directory. What a blessing. And if you're not in that, we want you to get in that. You can see Brother David or myself and we'll plug you in and get, get you pointed in the right direction. And uh, then we just continue to rejoice in all that God is doing. Continue to rejoice at seeing the family of God grow. And uh, we encourage you, as the Lord would lead you, uh, to help us get our role in order. If you feel like uh, it is time for you to become an official part of the Lake Church, we would love to invite you to do that. We give an invitation at every uh, Sunday morning service. And feel free to connect with me, call me, text me, email me, whatever you want to do. And I'd love to visit with you about that and see what God is going to to do. Let's stand as we continue in our worship together. Can I tell you, God made a way. There was no way for us to get to Him, so He came to us. What a blessing. Could not pay, but God is 
Amen. What a blessing. Thank you, ladies and, and Hannah. Hannah not only did that creative movement, but uh, choreographed it. So pretty impressive. Um, we're so blessed. People ask me, how are you doing? And I always say I'm just so blessed. And that's not just a, a phrase that I take lightly. We are a truly blessed, blessed people in so many ways. As we realize those blessings, we respond to those blessings. So ask our ushers to come as we receive our last offering for 2018. And uh, we look forward to greater things in 2019. I hesitate to say this, but I believe it with all of my heart. I do believe in 2019 we will pay off the property of the camp. I don't have a clue how, but I certainly didn't have a clue how we would get to this point so far. Uh, last Sunday, if you notice in your bulletin, the total offering was about $91,000. That's just amazing uh, in and of itself. And we're so thankful for the graciousness of folks but whatever you can do, we don't ever want to underestimate. Sometimes we make such a big deal about those who can give large amounts. But there's only one person in all of the Bible that Jesus called attention to for their faithful stewardship and financial giving. And it was the widow who gave very, very little in the world's estimation, but gave very, very much in the Lord. So we encourage you to do as the Lord would lead you each week with our tithes and offerings and then certainly with our camp challenge and with uh, the other ministries that God has blessed us with. Wow, God is a big God, and he is doing big, big things. How we look forward to the bigger things even yet to come. I'm going to ask the prettiest woman in the, in the crowd to lead us to the Lord in prayer, if she would. Good job, baby. Go ahead and pray for us. Hope you feel that way about your wives, husbands. I'm Emily. <laughs> I go to school at North Carolina Wesleyan College. I play soccer for them. Um, I'm a worship leader for our 
uh, FCA group. Uh, I'm majoring in exercise science. Uh, I want to be a physical therapist. <laughs> My mom's Mark and Tracy. <laughs> Maybe X out of it and go back into it. Yes. Can't wait till we get our own building and we never have any issues. Never. Never. We're going to put that in the contractor's contract. Anytime it starts, I'll stop. quite yet. Sing pretty baby. People come together, strange as neighbors, our blood is one. Children of generations of every nation. Kingdom come, so don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up, I don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from. Good God, 
His name is Jesus. Swing wide, all you heavens, let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All His children. Amen. Good stuff. We'll go ahead and dismiss our kiddos to children's small group in the back and encourage you to take your copy of God's Word. Turn with me to Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter 2. For the last time this year, we're going to be in this Christmas story. And uh, my prayer, though, it is our story every week of the year. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse number 8. As you may remember, the last three weeks we've been in a Christmas series Two weeks ago, uh, looking at the worship of Christmas, and then today we're looking at the witness of Christmas. So looking today at the witness of Christmas. The Bible says in verse number 38, or excuse me, verse number 8 of chapter 2, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. As I read this, uh, this particular week, it hit me that that is the uh, storyline of so many pastors today. And all of us could get caught up in that as pastors, that we just get comfortable keeping watch over our flock by night, by both day and night. But at the end of the day, there's more to it of being a shepherd than just watching sheep. Amen? You'll figure that out in a minute. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to... I like that part. I'm glad I don't have to figure out if I'm part of the group. I'm part of the all. Amen. Continue looking. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, the one and only. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. You've heard that before. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Well, it came to pass, verse 15, as the angels were now gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass. It's already settled in their mind. It's already happened. And the Bible says, The Lord made known unto us, verse 16, And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. 
Well, the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for the things they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Father, speak to us and through us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You note in your bulletin there's an insert. It's got the outline. I pray that it would be an encouragement to you and uh, something you might could look at a little bit later in case you miss anything. I want to give you by way of introduction, and by the way, we will be out of here on time because I got a plane to catch. Always wanted to say that. So uh, anyhow, a few specks amongst the nuggets. I always want to encourage you when you're studying the Word of God to look at the highlights but also take time to look at those things that may be a little less obvious. So by way of introduction, I need to give you a couple of specks in the midst of the nuggets. Number one, the shepherds. Were these just any ordinary shepherds? I mean, there are shepherds all over the world. If, if you were to go with us on a mission trip to Moldova, uh, there's a shepherd that lives uh, right next to the church, and every morning he takes sheep out and, and takes them out into the pasture, and every evening those sheep go back. I mean, you see shepherds all over the world, but these were specific shepherds. A couple of things to consider. Number one, their vocation. These were not a, a desirable bunch. Uh, this was not a, a career that you esteemed, that you would desire your children, that your son would grow up and be a shepherd. They were uh, lowly. They were outcast. They would have been very um, miserable people. They would have stunk. They would not have been pleasant to have been around in any way. That's their vocation. But more importantly in this text is their location. Now listen. You know what it's like to live in Bladen County. If you go 10 miles in one direction, you smell a hog plant. If you go 10 miles in another direction, you smell a chicken you know, plant. If you go 10 miles in another direction, you smell a paper plant. Hey, friend, you know what it smells like to me? Money. Tithes and offerings. Amen. We're glad for that. It's a wonderful smell. Listen, friend, it was the same in the days of the Bible. And there was a specific smell. And if you've ever traveled uh, globally, you've smelled this. Sheep have a very distinct smell. And sheep would have been kept out in the country, those kind of things. Um, we're going to be in New York City and we're probably not going to see, see any shepherds coming up and down the streets. That's just the way things were. And we understand their location though. These particular shepherds were around five miles from Jerusalem, maybe a little bit closer. In fact, they would have been between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. Bethlehem meaning the house of God. Bethlehem being the place where the Passover lambs were raised. These were a specific group of shepherds who were specifically uh, charged with raising Passover sheep that would have been during the Passover taken in and sacrificed in the holy city of Jerusalem. Don't miss that point because it's going to be really, really important in about 12 minutes, okay? Their vocation, their location. Number two, don't miss the speck of the sheep. As I said, these were the Passover lambs. Their purity, the Bible says in Hebrews 9, except there be the shedding of innocent, pure, holy blood, there's no remission of sin. These sheep were unique. These sheep were special. These sheep did not have a flaw, a speck. They were the perfect size and shape. They were the perfect uh, health. Listen, it's important we understand that God always demands and commands our best, whether it's the tithe, which is the first tenth, or whether it's our service, which is our best, not our leftovers. These Passover sheep were absolutely pure in every way, the most beautiful, spotless white sheep you've ever seen. But what was their purpose? Their purpose was not just to, you know, walk around outside of Jerusalem looking good and strutting their stuff, but their purpose was to be given as a sacrifice. They ultimately were being raised to die, to atone for man's sin according to the law. Remember those specs as we look together very quickly at three things. Number one, there is an announcement. What is the greatest announcement that has ever been made? If you are a grandparent here today, you may say it was when you found out that you were going to be a grandpa or a grandma. And those are wonderful announcements. But beloved, there is an announcement that supersedes every announcement that's ever been made. And it is this. 
the Christ child has been born. For 800 years they've been waiting and they've been watching and there's been great anticipation and now there is the announcement from the angels. Number one, notice the place of this announcement. There's a lot in this text and so quickly I want you to see where the shepherds were. It was at night. It was a dark and a lonely and a very a dangerous place. Listen, there were many predators out there that wanted those sheep uh, that didn't mind hurting a shepherd to get to the sheep. I'm thankful we have a shepherd that can't be hurt, but that's another story for another day. Friend, understand that where these shepherds were was a very dark and desolate place. They could not come into Bethlehem. They could not come into Jerusalem except by invitation. It is a picture of the lostness of man in a dark and a desolate and a desperate place unable to come to where God is. So thanks be to God that he chose to come to where we are. The place. Number two, the purpose. Listen, the angels did not just appear and say, good news, good news, Jesus has been born, and then whoosh. The purpose of the visits of the angels to the shepherds, three words, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. They were the first witnesses found in the Bible. They're the first ones to give this amazing invitation. And by the way, the one giving the invitation is not the angel. The angel had no right to give an invitation. God was inviting the shepherds by way of the angels. Here, get this. Don't miss this. You ready? Sometimes we feel way too much pressure that when we give an invitation, whether it's the pastor or whether it's you as you share your faith, you're thinking, man, I'm giving this invitation and how are they going to respond to me? Listen, you and I, we not, we're not giving the invitation. We're just the instruments that God is using. It is ultimately Him. It is the sweet Holy Spirit that draws people to Himself. The angels are just messengers and so are we. The purpose of their visit to those shepherds was an invitation from God himself. Number three, notice the passion of of this announcement. Can I ask you, what are you passionate about? What do we get passionate about? Brother Tom's a pastor and there are others here that have served in local churches, Brother David, others. And I want to tell you, through the years, and you're not going to believe this, but I've been in ministry now for 26 years. Isn't that amazing? Do I look old enough? But it's been amazing to me through the years. I think back about church services and about business meetings and about committee meetings and all of these things. And I'm amazed at what we get passionate about. You know, as a pastor, we can share our heart and our enthusiasm about what God is doing and the whole church just looks at us like this. But boy, people get passionate about it being too hot in church or too cold in church. About somebody sitting in their seat about somebody, you know, bringing the church bus back not clean. By the way, I went one time, the whole church was in an uproar because the young people had brought the bus back unclean, and I went in that bus and it was full of butterscotch wrappers. Y'all, can I tell you, young people do not eat butterscotch, and I'm going to say no more. I wanted to have a meeting of the whole youth group and sit around and talk about how messy my old people were. But anyway... We get passionate about the craziest things. We get passionate about basketball and about baseball. And some people even get passionate about soccer. I don't know how, but they do. But do we get passionate about the Lord Jesus? Listen, I want to tell you. One angel, the Bible says, and an angel stepped up and said, Jesus is born this day in the city of David. You shall come and find a sign, this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. 
And what you don't see is off stage right. There is a band of angels, a heavenly chorus, and they're sitting there listening to the lead singer. They're singing, they're they're listening to the lead vocalist as he makes this heavenly announcement and they can't stand it anymore. And the Bible says, and suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host saying glory to God. They just sprung out. That's a picture of what the church needs to be. It's not just my job as a solo to go out and win the lost or share the gospel, but as a church passionately reaching the world with this gospel. By the way, a little side note here. It's in your outline. There are two times that the Bible says that angels have a party. Two times that angels just let loose and rejoice and sing and worship. Number one, was when the Savior is born. And number two, when the sinner is born again. And I can't help but think the second is all because of the first, so they're still singing glorifying God because he truly made a way. Number one, there's an announcement. Number two, there's an acknowledgement. You understand that with this announcement, there is an RSVP. There must have been a response of the shepherds. Can you imagine if the shepherds would have looked up and said, Wow, that was really cool. Well, let's get back to what we were doing. Right? As I go preach revival, at the end of the revival, almost without exception, people said, Boy, I really enjoyed this revival. I hope you'll come back some other time. My heart's desire is that that revival has made a difference and that people are closer to the Lord and that the church is experiencing the fires of revival, not that they just enjoy the experience. I wonder sometimes and I worry sometimes about maybe being too entertaining or whatever. I want to tell you, this heavenly chorus would have been impressive and it would have been easy for the shepherds to say, wow, that really moved our hearts. Listen, can I tell you something? God wants to move our hearts, but he wants to move our hearts so that he'll move our legs into service. Amen? Does that make sense? I saw Tiger miss a puff the other day and got more than that, y'all. I mean, just think about that. These shepherds were moved, the acknowledgement. Number one, they responded to the invitation. How did they come? The Bible says in verse number 15, 16, and they came with haste. They came with haste. They left everything. Nothing else mattered, but they came with haste. They literally sprinted as best they could to see this thing. They responded to the invitation. Every person, and I know you say, you're a preacher, you want everybody to come to the altar. Listen, I just want you to come to Jesus and, and respond to his invitation, whatever it might be. But it's a beautiful picture of the excitement and the enthusiasm of someone who's truly had an encounter with the Holy God and they can't wait to see it for themselves. They responded to the invitation. They said, let us now go. Let us now go. Young people, by the way, there's a little uh, interesting note there. That's a good way to respond to things. Not, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll get to it directly. Let us now go with haste. Number two, don't miss this. They recognized their inspiration. They were not so impressed with the angels singing as they were with God's invitation. Verse 15, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass that the Lord has made known unto us. They understood that it literally was God speaking to them. Sure, the messengers of the angels were used, but it was God who made known. It is the the beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit of God working in our heart and allowing us to identify the things of God as being truth. Do you know the world around us does not believe in the truth of God? The truth of God's word, the truth of God's plan, the truth of God's church. It's a foreign concept. But they said, let us go, because this is God. And by the way, verse 15, the Bible says that they, when, when the moment they heard, they believed. Listen, I think it's interesting. The shepherds didn't say, let's go to Bethlehem, and if I see it, then I'll believe it. They said, let us go see this thing that is come to pass. They're putting it as done. 
You see, that's the way we need to look at prophecy. Not one of these days this is going to come to pass, but it's already come to pass because it's the Word of God unchanging. Number one, there's an announcement. Number two, there's an acknowledgement. And number three, and we are done, there is an abandonment. An abandonment. I noticed this. I don't know that I've ever seen it before. Verse 16, 17 rather, and when they had seen it, when they came to Jesus, there's not much information about their visit. I wish there were a couple of more verses in here about what they saw and what it sounded like and what it smelled like and what it felt like, but we don't get that. They were beckoned to, to Bethlehem. They came, they saw, and they went. Don't you wish sometimes your Christmas guests would do that? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I love my mother-in-law, bless her heart. I'm just kidding, she didn't come see me. The fact of the matter was that the moment they had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, immediately they knew they had to go and tell somebody. Oh, by the way, before I forget, these poinsettias, there's two back there and there's about six here. We need to find homes for them because we don't need them anymore and they're not going to continue to be good if we keep them here. So if you know somebody that could use a poinsettia, will you please get that after the service and will you take it to them and give it to them with love from the Lake Church? We all do that. <laughs> They're free. Hey, hands all over the house. Thank you. You see, that's kind of what our invitation every Sunday is. I come to church and... You mean I'm going to get something that I can take and give to people who need it? Who are desperately searching for something? You know, if you show up at somebody's house with a flower and you say, we're giving this to you in love. We don't want anything from it. We're not ex you don't have to come to our church. You don't have to send a tithe. We just want you to know that we love you and Jesus does too. That's a wonderful thing. But that's what we do with the gospel every single week. But listen, there, it requires a level of abandonment. Let, let, me, let me close with this. Now remember, you've got to go back and think through. Remember those specks? The shepherds just outside of Jerusalem, between Bethlehem and Jerusalem, they were raising a specific kind of sheep. Their one purpose was to die. They would not be sheared. They would not be, you know, used for any other purpose but to die. The Passover lambs, a special group. Okay, you got that. Now, here we go. The abandonment, verse 17. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad. Acts 1.8 says, After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. We call that here, there, and everywhere. Abroad. And the shepherds made known this thing abroad concerning this child. They didn't go on a tour and say, come meet the men who met the man. Verse 18. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. I think it's interesting. It doesn't say everybody believed. Do you know not everybody's going to believe just because you share? Not everybody's going to accept Christ just because you share, but that didn't give us any reason not to share with everybody. The abandonment. Number one, they abandoned their post. What was their post? It was to raise the Passover lambs to be taken into Jerusalem and sacrificed for the remission of sins. I like this part. I think about the shepherds. They've now come to Bethlehem. They've seen this child. No doubt they're weeping and they're rejoicing and they, and they congratulate Mary and Joseph, I'm sure. And immediately they turn and they begin making their way to spread the good news. And all of a sudden they say, wait a minute, wait a minute, we've got some unfinished work to do. And they go out to where their flock was and there they are, the most beautiful, pure, white, spotless lambs that you've ever seen out there by in the field. And they look at those sheep and they, and, and, and they uh, what are they? and they salute, there we go, and they salute those sheep and they say, dismissed, you're no longer needed. There's no reason for you to stay in these pastures anymore. There's no purpose for you anymore for the Lamb of God has been born. I mean, that's precious. They adjusted their post. There was no need for them to continue to raise those Passover lambs. Think about it. 
in an instant. We can think back to the, the story of Abraham and Isaac. But daddy, where's the lamb? But daddy, I don't understand. You've built a fire. It's roaring now. It's ready for the sacrifice. Daddy, where's the lamb? And Abraham, with a heartbreaking, is about to take his son's life. And he says, son, you've got to understand that one day God will provide himself as a lamb. And about that time, there's a rustling in the bush and there's a ram caught in the thicket. Isaac's life was spared, but even then, looking through the quarters of time, realizing that once upon a time, there would come a child, and his name would be Jesus. Not only did they abandon their post, they adjusted their purpose. They adjusted their purpose. All their lives, these shepherds had one particular purpose. And it was to prepare the Passover lamb. Now their purpose was adjusted. From now on, they would proclaim the Passover lamb. As we end a year and begin anew, as a church, like never before, we need to adjust our purpose. We understand that the shepherds were compelled, they were convicted, they were converted, and they were consumed. But the question is, will we be? The older I get, the more I realize that God did not just call me to tend to sheep. Can I tell you, I'm a good sheep tender. I do my best. We got a lot of sheep. A lot of hurting people, a lot of dying people. A lot of needs. And I want to do the very best job I can of tending to sheep. Does that make sense? Say amen. amen. But at the end of the day, if all I do is tend sheep, then I'm really missing my, my purpose. Not only as a pastor, but as a believer. At the end of the day, God is not going to hold me accountable for the number of visits I make, and I believe in making visits, so don't misunderstand. How many counseling sessions I... I led, how many weddings I performed, how many funerals I had the honor of speaking at. But all that God is going to hold me accountable for is what did you do with the gospel? Did you use it as a source of encouragement just for you? A sense of pride and belonging? A sense of joy that you're going to have your sins spared? Or did you take the gospel like the shepherds abroad telling everyone, all throughout the Bible, we see when people meet Jesus, whether he's a little baby lying in a manger, whether he's a grown man sitting on the side of a well, whether he's a man walking through Jericho looking up into a sycamore tree, whenever people met with Jesus, their lives were radically changed. Amen? Just as the way it is. Then why is it that we see so very few people who call themselves Christians today but they don't live any different. And it's as if their lives have never been radically changed. Beloved, what an opportunity. You've heard the announcement. There's a Savior. He's been born. There's been an acknowledgement one way or the other in your heart and in mine. But this morning, will there be an abandonment? God, I'm going to turn loose of everything else that's consuming me. Listen, I, we've got to have jobs and we've got to have the responsibilities of life. I'm not talking about shirking those duties. But putting the gospel first and foremost in everything we do. Wow. That's a lofty goal, preacher. I believe God has called us to have mighty lofty goals. Amen. Father, thank you for this amazing story of this group of people who are so unlikely to be the first to hear the good news Lord, they were not the religious sect. They were not the who's who of the temple leadership. But Lord, they were outcast. Father, I thank you that even today you choose the foolish things to confound the wise. Fools that are willing to just totally submit to you. Abandoning all to live for you. God, I thank you that those sheep were released from their duty. Lord, that today we do not have to travel to Jerusalem but simply to allow our hearts to respond to the old rugged cross 
He who knew no sin became sin, my sin, our sin, so that we might be made the righteousness of God. What a thought, what a story, what a message. And oh God, that we would tell it like never before. God, I pray that as a new year begins, you would give us a renewed desire to see the lost become saved, the saved disciple, so that we would grow, not just numerically, not just in our finances and in our buildings, but God, spiritually ever so close to thee, and then give us the passion of the angelic choir. For God, we have experienced something that even they have not, what it is to be amongst the redeemed. In Jesus' sweet name, amen and amen. Would you stand your feet all over the, ho- over the house of God? Open our eyes that we might see, open our hearts that we might know, our minds to receive, and our lives to be transformed. I'm here at the altar. If there's anything that I can do for you to pray or to encourage you, if God's moving in your heart to accept Christ, what a day as you respond to the invitation from God himself, whatever it might be, as we do business with him. as we close our service this morning. The Ketchum family, you guys come on. We're grateful to have Mark and Tracy and you met uh, Emily earlier, she sang, and then the one I call a little bit. Um, they're coming today to officially unite with our church as dual members and uh, they're here about half the time and in Jacksonville, North Carolina, half the time and, uh, and other places in college and, and at my house about half the time. So those are good things. Um, But I wonder this morning if you would just celebrate with them this decision to continue to minister through the Lake Church in a little bit more official capacity, to love them, to lock arms and hearts and join them in ministry. Would you say amen? Amen. Good stuff, guys. We love you and so grateful for you. If you don't know them, get to know them. Uh, They will be a blessing to you in so, so many ways. I'm going to ask one other group to come if they would real quick, and that is those that are going to New York with us this afternoon, and we're going to have a closing prayer with them. And... uh, at the end of the service, the Ketchums are going to be here. Come by, love on them, greet them, extend the right hand of fellowship uh, with them. All right, come on, guys. There's a total of 10 of us uh, going this afternoon. We fly out at 210 from Myrtle Beach, and we'll get there, um, well, whenever the plane lands. 3, 358. So pray for us. Uh, 
different ministries every day, but homeless ministry and then also working in our church there at Nueva Vida. We encourage you, our hope is to go to New York at least twice a year, maybe three times a year as, as we can, as we can afford to, and as the Lord leads us, uh, lots of ministry to do there. And also looking for some other partnerships that God would lead in that. It's important for me and for us as a church that we don't get so consumed with what we're doing right here that we lose sight of what we're supposed to be doing here, there, and everywhere. So um, that's very scriptural. So guys, we love you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Leah's in Children's Church, and then we have two that are meeting us. So that's, that's all ten. Brother David, would you come lead us in prayer over this group? And uh, then we're going to slip out as quickly as we can. We need to be on the road in 21 minutes so uh, that we can make it to Myrtle Beach in time to get checked in. Listen, this week, I want to seriously, on the, that was not just a sermon illustration, on these um, poinsettias, please take them to someone and share them if you would. Um, remember Joey and Pat especially. Um, Joey's very, very weak. His mind is strong as it's ever been. Uh, for those that don't know him, he's been battling pancreatic cancer since February 25th of 2016 and uh, so that's just about a world record uh, to make it almost three years but he's still strong in his mind and, and he, if you happen to have the opportunity to go by and visit with he and Pat they're, they're a blessing to visit and uh, would be a blessing uh, to you so especially with us being gone for the next three days if you could kind of uh, cover a little bit of that let us know while we're gone if you know of any needs uh, we'll certainly want to do that where are Mike and Denise at? there they are Mike and Denise would you guys please stand let me acknowledge you um, Denise lost her dad this week and a godly, godly man had the privilege of knowing him just a little bit and uh, her sweet mom and sisters and what a blessing to be a part of their, of their family these last few weeks so we just want you to know that we love you we're continuing to pray for you and um, certainly many folks in this room can identify with what you're going through a very difficult time of year for their family and for others again we love you we thank God for you and for all that he's doing um, we'll see you next year okay so. Let's stand for a prayer. Father, we thank you for the message you've heard from the good news of Jesus Christ is coming forth for a very special purpose to take care of the sins of the world. Lord, I pray that as we go from this place, that we're not silently waiting to hear from you, but we're ready to go out and tell all the good news. Father, may we meet someone this week, and when we do, when we bring them into our presence, may we be able to shout the glory of heaven has come to earth. Yes. To save us from our sins, to give us life, to give us purpose, to give us reason. And Lord, when you call us to rewrite our ways, let us follow you. Knowing, Lord, that's the best place to go. I pray for those on this trip that while they're away from this place, they will represent you as an ambassador of Christ. And that place in New York, Lord, is a minister to those needs and the people that are living in darkness. May they see the light of Christ in this group and come back with stories, Lord, of the glory of heaven coming down to that place. Watch over them as they travel, as they say, may they fellowship together, Lord, and be close to one another through this time. We glorify you, Lord, for what you've done for us in 2018. We look forward to what you will do through us and with us in 2019. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.